Professor Gupta, wonderful to finally be talking face to face. How are you? Lovely to be talking to you, although it's not quite face to face, but hopefully yeah. at some point it will be. Yes, hopefully we'll correct that. Um, and I'm, I'm here in Cape Town and you are in Oxford. I'm in Oxford indeed. And it's Stuck a with the... typically gloomy English day. Okay. Day. Yeah. So it's been wonderful uh, watching your many interviews. Uh, I just want to tell you that at the at the beginning, when that first clip came through, there was a almost a, a, a mini celebration that went on because at the very beginning in all of this, we were felt very isolated. There weren't a lot of people who were echoing our concerns with the consequences of lockdown and so on. And uh, you know, the, the early voices, uh, yours and uh, Professor Levitt. They were, they were actual gems for us. Well, I mean, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, very gratifying. But, you know, similarly for me, you know, there I was thinking the way I was thinking and, and I also felt very isolated. And for me as well to have people like Professor Levitt speaking out was, um, you know, really helpful. And I think though that it's been one of the strengths of this movement if you like that we've all the people involved now have all independently come to this conclusion it's not been a sort of oh my friend thinks so so i better agree with her you know it's it's almost mm. the opposite we've in spite of the general kind of consensus and the feeling about how things should go we we've um all been um you know felt compelled really to say what we think um, is a better approach to this problem, which often I think I think many it's cost us friends, I think, many of us. Yes. But yes, that is also, a sad consequence, but also made new friends. Yeah, but it's also brought us together in a mm. in a in a community of, of proper integrity and honesty where we're really in this because we believe in what we're doing rather than yes. um, anything else. Before we talk too much about the here and now, um, can I uh, ask you just to tell us a little bit about your your early years? I mean, I see you started life in Calcutta. I did. I was born in Calcutta, um, but I actually spent most of my early childhood in um, Africa. So oh. when I was a year and a half, my father got a job in Ethiopia. And so my mother and I, um, and my father, we went to Ethiopia where I spent first three years of my life, really, um, where I became conscious, I guess. So I have very fond memories of, of Ethiopia. And then we moved to Zambia, where we lived in the bush in northern Zambia for, for three years, which uh, was just amazing. Where about? Uh, in uh, the Luapula province. Oh, yeah. Um, so there was one of my a, favorite. One of my favorite uh, destinations. I love traveling to Zambia. Well, the, this place was just idyllic. I mean, my parents were teaching in a, a girls' boarding school, uh, really in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And um, it's a very international community of teachers. And um, there were lots of kids under the age of five, like myself. And, and we just had such a fantastic time on our tricycles. <laughs> roaming around in the elephant grass. Nobody seemed to mind too much. Maybe that's where some of my ideas, innate sort of feelings about risk come from. I mean, there's so much that's to be gained in life, which being locked up. I mean, if my parents had been worried about me then and locked me in the house while they went off mm -hmm. to teach, um, then I wouldn't have had that wonderful experience of great freedom. One of my one of my favorite weeks in my life was there. I uh, I'm, I'm a enthusiastic uh, birder. All right. And uh, we went to explore a property uh, up against the DRC border, um, mm -hmm. and it it just to chart it out. So it, it was quite a collection of people. There was a, a herpetologist and several ornithologists and a couple of very experienced field guides and. Uh, we were going through this Brachystegia woodland interspersed with uh, these vast razor grass dambos. 
-hmm. and with islands in the middle mm -hmm. and uh, blundering through the, the grass to get, get to, and the marsh to get to these islands. And it was the most amazing feeling when you set foot on them, you had this feeling like that you could be the first humans to, to go there because who would be mad enough to brave the, the razor grass. And on the islands were, of course, these pristine uh, Brachistegia woodland environments oh, with uh, yeah, no. bird life and uh, insects and everything. I mean, it's just, it was just glorious. It's just uh, uh, idyllic. And yes, indeed, we used to cross what was then known as the Congo Pedicle. This is in the early 70s to get, get to the rest of Zambia. So that right. was the way to... Of course, um, I, I remember that term. I haven't heard it for years. Yeah. Hmm. So, and, so that was my early childhood. And then we spent a year in the UK because my father by then had become uh, really interested in African history. So we came back here while he did a, a master's at Birmingham. And then we went back and spent three years in uh, Lusaka, which was yeah. not quite as exciting, but, you know, a wonderful um, education that I got there. Um, and at the time, uh, many of my teachers were actually from South Africa, who'd, who'd left South Africa. This is in the mid 70s and, and would speak with such nostalgia about, <laughs> particularly I had a teacher, um, Mrs. Fatar, who came from Cape Town, she'd speak with such nostalgia that I always wanted to visit Cape Town. And uh, very fortunately, early this year, I, I was able to, to get to Cape Town. So, <laughs> um, because in those days, of course, there was no way someone with an Indian passport. <laughs> no, no ways at all. But in both directions, almost, there was such hostility. Yeah. Um, and and how old were you when you worked out that you wanted to go into healthcare? Well, it's interesting because um, uh, uh, I think I, th there was part of me that wanted to be a doctor, uh, but then also part of me that didn't really want to uh, that, that wanted to spend time, well, I was attracted to the physical sciences as well. So it was, it, throughout my life, I had this sort of, you know, being torn in various directions, being pulled in various directions uh, because of my various interests. So when I went back to India, um, when I was age, aged 11, um, I think I kind of had this idea that I wanted to be a doctor and save people and all that. Uh, then I became very, very interested in uh, physics and mathematics and how you can apply mathematics to understand the physical world. Um, and that kind of became what I wanted to do academically anyway. But, and then I ended up eventually at Princeton University, um, again, through Africa. My father in, in, in India taught... Um, when we went back, he got a job at the university teaching African history, but always wanted to go back to Africa. So he, we went just after I finished high school, we went to Liberia. I went to Liberia with my parents on uh, a sabbatical. So I did a year of university there and then transferred to the States. Um, but in Princeton, because it had this sort of liberal arts education um, system, I was able to sort of pursue several interests. So I took classes in physics and maths and biology, I'm very interested in animal behavior. So while I was taking a course in animal behavior, I realized you could use maths to understand biological systems. And that drew me to that whole discipline. And then within that, infectious diseases became a kind of play, place where my original desire to do something in infectious disease and healthcare met with my interests in sort of theory and mathematics. So that's how I got drawn into it. So somewhere along the line, somebody pointed out to me that you also had a side interest in evolutionary biology. Is that correct? Well, I think what I do is evolutionary biology. Um, that's my uh, that's the main thing, main thrust of what I do. Okay. So, so in, how do you, use maths and physics in evolutionary biology? So, um, so fundamentally what I look at is how infectious disease systems evolve. And infectious disease systems are ecological systems because they involve two species at least. 
the host and the pathogen. And so if you look at it through that lens, you're, you, you can set up mathematical, you can use mathematical methods. We use a combination of mathematical methods, uh, lab work and field work to build up a kind of jigsaw puzzle of not just what is happening now. So I've worked, for example, a lot on malaria and you get, you have data on malaria, disease and infection and all of that. And you, you kind of piece that together to get a sense of what's happening now. But, oh, there's my coffee. Copy arriving, very important. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. So, <laughs> Oh dear, I didn't actually send out the... Uh, that was a... That, that was, that was, that was that was telepathic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, telepathic spontaneous. So, um, yeah, so you have this ecological system with the um, us and the bug. And so what I look at is not just trying to make sense of what's going on now, but how this evolved. Mm. how this interaction evolved so you know with flu for example is something I work on a lot I try and figure out how influenza evolved and how we evolved if you like to get to where we are now and to try and understand where we're going um, and and where where do you think in the the long journey from uh, bacteria and archaea to homo sapiens sapiens where along the way did a, a virus first arrive? Oh, that's a very difficult question to answer. There are different um, ideas. I suspect it was, a, I mean, some viruses probably sort of predated all of this and then others um, evolved along the way. I mean, each time there's a sort of new setting and new organisms kind of mm -hmm come up to exploit the new opportunities. So it would be wrong to lump all viruses into one category. I mean, so complicated. One of my favorite sort of popular science reason, recent years uh, was Nick Lane's book. Um, you know, the guy I'm talking about. Uh, Absolutely, I know Nick Lane. The, the vital question. Yes. And he speculates about the the deep origins of uh, membranes. Well, I should say more than speculates. It wasn't speculative. Yeah. He proposes mm -hmm. a, a, high, a very interesting hypothesis for uh, the formation of membranes in um, alkaline vents in the deep oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a lovely book because it makes the layman think about um, how complicated even the simplest structure in our uh, anatomies uh, uh, is at a, at a level of detail and how would it come about in, in exactly in a and how it might have evolved in a completely different context and then become co-opted by the cell yes so yes. so it's um evolution is fascinating mm. and mm. so I, I mean i do a lot of work i mean of course i've been in this field for so long so again going back to malaria um i look at not just how the parasite has evolved but also how we've evolved. So, mm. I mean, well-known conditions such as sickle cell disease mm -hmm. are an evolutionary Adaptation. response to yeah. malaria because mm. of, it's only because this um, deleterious condition gives you protection from death from malaria that it's mm. risen in frequency in many parts of the world. Mm. Not so, in Africa. <laughs> yeah, well, Africa particularly, yes. Mm. Um, mm. So, so that's another whole area that I work on. So I have a lot of diverse interests in infectious diseases, but um, most of them, many of them do center around how they've evolved. But what's yeah. nice is that that can actually translate into some very uh, specific benefits. So for example, right now we're working on a universal flu vaccine and that came from our theory of how flu evolves. That actually led to a new idea for how to make a universal flu vaccine, which we've, which we tested, and now have um, patented and licensed to um, an investor in the U.S. who is helping us develop it. So you know, it's it's not just kind of fun uh, mm. speculation. 
And I mean, flu that is a, itself is quite flu, rewarding. Flu is a more complicated structure than the coronavirus, right? Well, flu has, yes, it has the ability to mutate the parts that we recognize mm -hmm. um, and make immune responses to. So in a way that the coronavirus doesn't. doesn't. So, it, so it's traditionally seen as a kind of arms race, the, the evolutionary mm -hmm. process. But the, a model that we published about 15 years ago suggested that maybe it wasn't quite like that. That maybe instead of being this sort of continuous arms race, flu was just sort of um, sort of running around in a circle and that it only had a few possible things that it could be and it just kept running around within that circle and that gave us a new idea about how to vaccinate how to develop a vaccine that would protect you against all strains of flu because at the moment you have to keep updating your vaccine as the virus changes so that's um, kind of an insight I mean that came from an You've also done model. work on HIV, which is a big problem in South Africa, obviously. Um, tuberculosis? TB is the one um, pathogen that I haven't done much work on mm. among the, the, the big ones, <laughs> partly because it doesn't um, evolve much. I mean, right. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, most of the work that I do uh, really uh, applies to pathogens that have some capacity for change or exist in a variety of flavors like the coronaviruses that this is only one of several coronaviruses mm. and there are four that are circulating right now that we call seasonal coronaviruses and I think it's uh, very useful to, to have a theoretical framework that, that visualizes the current incursion of the coronavirus as occurring in this sort of ecological setting where mm. you have all these other four related bugs. Mm. That's a very important aspect of mm. this. Yeah, I mean, circulating, circulating and seasonal, if I could get the journalists in South Africa to agree, agree upon, upon two concepts, it would be those two. Yes, because we, we've got them all speculating and talking up a big scare story around a second wave that's going to hit South Africa starting in a few weeks, which is the middle of our summer. It well, makes no sense. No, that really doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, that's not I mean, if we're going to learn from precedent, mm. um, that's not what happened anywhere. We, we even have the head of our ministerial advisory committee saying this. So, I mean, it's just it, it, it's a pinch me moment, you know. Uh, one of the staggering charts for me was the comparison of the the, the two big um, uh, North American uh, climatic regions, their uh, epidemi epidemiological curves for uh, for COVID compared to the curves for SARS-1. And I mean, you, you, you'd you have to look really hard to tell them apart. The, mm -hmm. uh, th that fascinated me because I, I kind of had this intuition that um, it might be different the first time around when a new pathogen hits the scene. It might not go seasonal immediately. Mm -hmm. And I, I clung to that idea for quite for way too long. It was actually mm -hmm. a mistake on my part. People were telling me, no, this is going to be seasonal. And it took me a long time to be convinced that this was something to be taken seriously. And I, I feel a bit bad about that because who was I to say in the first place? But um, the, uh, that, that chart of the, the, the concordance between SARS-1 and SARS-2 um, was just a, a wake up moment. Well, I think the, it, it does become, but it, you know, how long it takes to become seasonal mm. depends on a number of factors. Mm. And when one of them paradoxically is how quickly you lose immunity. So if you, if like measles, everyone becomes immune, gains lifelong immunity, you'll actually get more of this sort of, uh, you know, sort of deeper troughs and higher peaks on the way to it becoming seasonal. Whereas mm. if you lose immunity more quickly as one does with coronaviruses, that endemic equilibrium, that, sorry, I mean, that's a big word, that um, the, the becoming seasonal occurs mm. much more rapidly. Yeah, I understand. Uh... So. so I think that, and the other thing is that we do, it's becoming clearer that having uh, exposure to the other coronaviruses gives you some immunity already. Right, the cross-reactivity. So, ooh, what happened? 
Oh, there we go. That, right. that was the that was the chart that impressed me. Right. I I found yeah. it a bit uh, a bit spooky. Mm -hmm. No, that's this year's North American outbreak or U.S. outbreak compared yeah. to the SARS cases in two thousand and three. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it made me it stopped me in my tracks. <laughs> yeah. No, I th I think that um, I think there's a lot to be learned from comparing. I mean, the the, the problem is we, we make people are bound to make comparisons, but um, they can be helpful and they can also hinder. So. Right. Of course, there's this sort of people's that there's a focus on this idea that there will be another great big pandemic, which is right. sort of a hangover from 1918. So that was a long time ago. And I think that what's really changed between then and now is that now we don't have communities that live in complete isolation. So the overall level of exposure to influenza in any community in the world is um, is much higher than it was in the high. And how much do you think it had to, that outbreak had to do with the, the kind of febrile state of the world? Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I remember being told when I was young that that uh, influenza epidemic had killed a lot of young people. And um, I, it, it sort of seems to me it must have been the case that the years of stress and probably poor nutrition during the war um, must have had something to do with the scale and severity of that outbreak. So I think, I mean, people have tested that um, yes. but have not found much of a signal. Uh, so for example, they've compared, were there more deaths in soldiers, were there all of that, and it's hard. But I have a theory which um, I've been touting for a while, but it is difficult to prove or disprove. But I think what happened prior to 1918 is that because of the way the world was structured, epidemics or pandemics tended to sweep through and die out because you know the population densities were low, people didn't travel all the time, so the entry, you know, likelihood of flu coming and taking off in the UK, for example, was, was very low until mm. 1918. And if you look back at the history of mm -hmm. so-called, you know, what people call flu pandemics, mm -hmm. they are they occur regularly every 30 years or so. Mm. There was one in 1890. There was mm -hmm. the one before that, I think, was sort of more in the 1840s. Um, and then again in the early 19th century. And you can have, you see this regular pattern stretching all the way back to sort of 1590 mm -hmm. or something. Um, so my theory is that between 1890 and 1918, there was no flu around in England, in the UK, right. like lots of Europe anyway. So, so people didn't yeah. have the, uh, the immunity or the immune response that they would have nowadays, typically. Exactly. So, and, and precisely that cohort. Have you, can you speculate? The first were not immune and they yeah. died. Yeah. Can you speculate about this? Well, to me, it's a mystery anyway, about why uh, neonates are infected by the flu, but apparently not by COVID. Oh, they are infected by COVID and they have, a, a, so with the other seasonal coronaviruses, it's a very similar pattern. They yeah, so mm -hmm. I was using the word affected, meaning they're not dying from it like oh, yeah, they yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. So they get infected by the age of five. Mm -hmm. Everyone's had all the seasonal coronaviruses typically, and they do die. Now, in, what's happened is this new coronavirus has had a very low mortality in infants. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that might be because um, it's come, I mean, many of those infants that it would have killed maybe are already mm -hmm. immune to some other coronavirus, which mm -hmm. is what I think is protecting young people anyway. The reason young people have such high protection is because they've all recently been infected Quite or sustained similar. almost their first infection with mm. a coronavirus. Mm. And they still have a lot of cross immunity mm. to other coronaviruses, including the new one. Mm. But as you get yes. older, you get reinfected and your immunity becomes more and more focused on specific 
seasonal viruses and you paradoxically lose your broader immunity. Mm -hmm. I, I th again, it's a hypothesis, but we, um, we have a paper um, under yes. review. Looking no, at I haven't read the paper, but I was familiar. With, I knew that you had that idea mm. and it's, it was very interesting to me. Um, the, the, the related question is the naming of this virus. Uh, that original naming p paper um, made the point that they didn't want to call it SARS because particularly in Asia that conjured up uh, an idea of terror um, and they didn't want to cause a panic. So they gave it a name that was they haven't done very <laughs> no, they haven't done well. Yeah. Well, they gave it a completely new name, mm -hmm. um, which, in my mind, has actually caused the, the the whole novelty of the virus to be completely overstated. Um, mm -hmm. In the in the very paper, they point out that that uh, COVID is an individuum of of uh, of SARS, mm -hmm. um, and yet we have this uh, almost this religious mantra that it's a new deadly virus. Yes. Um, I wonder what, yes, I think calling it SARS-CoV-2 is not um, helpful mm. in that regard. Mm. But calling it, because that aligns it with the SARS virus, mm. and calling it COVID is also, well, I suppose the disease is called COVID, strictly speaking, but mm. it also get, conjures up the idea that it's something new. Now, unfortunately, the other coronaviruses just have these kind of uh, mm funny AI type names, like NL63 yes. and... H1N1 and so on, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe we should just give given it a number. Yes. Like one of the, the asteroids in the Little Prince or something. So, yeah, just <laughs> uh, That reminds me, I, I was going to ask you about your, uh, your background as a writer. What happened in your life that enabled you to juggle a very busy scientific career with uh, translating and, uh, and writing? Well, writing was always a passion. So I remember, I mean, uh, having the, the privilege of, you know, growing up in, in the bush, I didn't really get, get to go to school until I was six, which I think is brilliant and um, would recommend that for <laughs> any child. Um, but, and so I didn't learn to read until I was, a little bit older than most people. Uh, and as soon as I learned to read and write, I remember I wrote a story and the thrill that I got out of this, you know, two line story um, was one that kind of, I, I've never forgotten and, and has never left me. So mm -hmm. I, from then on, I just kept, I just had to write. Um, it's a compulsion, you just have to do it. So, so that's always been something I've wanted to do and, and kept doing. And I'm just really very lucky that I managed to publish some of the stuff that I write. Um, so I'm just very lucky that I can do that. I'm, I mean, most people actually do more than one thing, um, really. It's just, yes. I, I just think I'm very lucky that yes. someone's taken it seriously. Most people do more than one thing. That's true. <laughs> it's true. They do. Most people have lots of passions. And that's what yeah. I think it's um, very important to recognize that to live a full and rich life, mm. that, that you will do that. And you don't have to always be rewarded yeah. for it. I mean, you have to do, my father always used to say, you have to do something to make mm. a living. And mm. either that can be your passion mm -hmm. or it's just something you do and then you follow your other passions. But passions elsewhere. You've got to, it struck me time and time again throughout this that it is the people who are more broadly educated and uh, have a sort of a sense of perspective who are who are much less likely to jump on the lock lockdown bandwagon and um, this this balkanization of um, uh, the universities in particular but not just the universities it's actually also a commercial enterprise um, is such a bad thing in this regard uh, pe them, people draw conclusions from a very narrow frame of reference and then just miss the, uh, the complexity of the system that they're dealing with and the consequential um, uh, results the, 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 or, the, or the, the potential for adverse consequences, unforeseen consequences, you know. I couldn't agree more. I really think that that is, this is a stark mm -hmm. reminder of how we need to have, you know, not be monocular in mm -hmm. our vision mm -hmm. or in what we do. There's also another issue which so about four years ago, I went to this wonderful conference um, organized by another writer, Amit Chaudhary, 
Um, and he, ha he, they actually have a movement called literary activism and they organize these fantastic meetings. And I was earlier this year, I went to one which was on failure, which is also fantastic. But the one on um, uh, four years ago was on deprofessionalization. And the central question there was that I was supposed to address is why do I do two things? And that mm. made me think about what is a profession? Mm. And a profession in its worst interpretation is something that exactly keeps you focused on just the one thing that you're doing to the point where you absolve your responsibilities. You know, you, 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 you abdicate rather your responsibilities, you're absolved of them. And um, what comes to mind there, I use this example of, there's a play called um, Mephisto, which you, was made into a film. I don't know if you- Yeah, sure. So, and, um, uh, and the central character is this playwright, oh no, actor, sorry, based on a real person, I think, uh, actor during the Nazi period who kind of sold out to the Nazis. And there's that last scene where he is being challenged about having sold out to the Nazis. And he puts his head in his hands. Uh, in the film, it's played, played by Klaus Maria Brandauer. And he says, leave me alone. I am just an actor. You know, yes. can't you leave me alone? I'm just, and nobody is just an actor or no, just a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that is part of the problem. Are there yeah. some, there's some report of somebody saying, Oh, well, the thing about Sage is they were told, you know, you have to bring down, tell us how to bring down the cases. And so they came up with this idea of suppression. Yeah. And that was their job and that's what they did. And it's not their job to do anything else. And you just think, really? Yes. Yeah. Is, is that how we're going to? Oh, and, you know, you know, I, I took the approach from the very beginning to just go massively diverse in the people uh, in Panda. Mm. Um, because it, the complexity is overwhelming. There, there's, no, um, there's no end to uh, the, the proliferation of problems in the problem set and no end to the usefulness of having the, the field doctor, you know, with yeah. an immunological background mm -hmm. talking to the modeler, you know. Absolutely, um, but with yeah. humility, with humility. Well, the, the, the thing for me, humility, if you get enough excitement around curiosity, mm -hmm. arrogance and humility is just not in the room because okay. people are excited to be engaging and exploring and are learning from each other. And so the, the personal is lost. I mean, I, I, I play this game in business all the time of trying to alienate the, the origin, the, the new idea from, from the creator of the idea as quickly as yeah. possible, but, yeah. but often by devilish means like false mm -hmm. attribution. You know, um, uh, because it's just so important if you want to get that spirit mm -hmm. of the, that zip of curiosity, uh, burning, mm -hmm. burning ingenuity kind of thing, yeah. sparkle, elect electricity, you, you've got to do it in an environment where the, the ownership is lost very quickly and, and the, the problem becomes much more interesting than the potential for personal gain, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and this is what's lost in academia. This is yes. where academia has started to fail us. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, we had it right at the beginning when we started questioning our local modelers, we were saying to them, you've got, you overestimated the fatality rates, you've overestimated the susceptibility. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be not thinking in terms of serology levels of 60, 70%. Mm -hmm. There's other layers to the immune system that are important mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And you need to think about the peaks and seasonality eventually we added to that list. The peaks, you, you're projecting yes. peaks out in October, they're gonna come June, July. Mm -hmm. um, we made all these points. And the reaction wasn't to address any of them. The reaction was to say, you guys are, depending on who you were speaking to, not epidemiologists or not healthcare actuaries, you know, well, uh, depending on the that's what I've received, which is that I'm in the pay of libertarian think tanks. Ah, <laughs> yes, uh, that's funny that. We also had this libertarian angle thrown at us and mm. I, I, we haven't got a single, I mean, not that I think there's anything particularly um, uh, wrong with somebody being a libertarian, but we haven't got a single person in the team who I think would really identify as a libertarian. Uh, but it was a constant refrain, ultra-right, yeah, libertarian, constant. whatever. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think there are, it depends on how you interpret libertarian. I mean, uh, but I, and the other thing is to distinguish it from people who happen to be right wing and liberal that doesn't make them libertarian yeah. um, and i don't think that it might you know this is an issue that transcends i mean for me left and right wing is about how you decisions that you make about the market and 
how, so, how things operate. But in, in terms of the, the common interest in, in I mean, to, to want a better word, just the, the common good, I think that um, I yeah. think that, that's pretty I, basic. I yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, for me, this whole idea of a left-right spectrum has stopped being useful more or less at the time of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's about on one spectrum, you've got the degree to which people think personal agency is important um, mm -hmm. and resistance of authority against authority. And then on another uh, angle altogether, you've got a degree of resistance to change, which is a revolutionary versus conservative. Yeah, so you're liberal, liberal versus authoritarian on one axis mm -hmm. and uh, revolutionary conservative on another. Mm -hmm. there, there should never be talk of conservative versus liberal. They aren't opposites. And therefore, left, right doesn't make sense anymore. At a okay. time, roughly at the French Revolution, mm -hmm. um, all your liberals were, were revolutionary and yes. all your conservatives were authoritarian. And right. that's not the case. So we have to move away from that and, and uh, stop calling each other names. Uh, left, right, whatever. I, I, I just, mm -hmm. yeah, because I just another thought... typology I find very useful is one from uh, the anthropologist Susan Douglas, which yes. also has this axis which is individualistic to communitarian and hierarchical to egalitarian. And yeah. again, you know, different attitudes map yes. onto that yes. in ways that, um, you know, make it a, much more nuanced. And, and what I've noticed in um, academia, what's happened is one has shift, there's a shift, there's been a shift between from hierarchy to egalitarian. So it used to be, academia used to be very hierarchical, but very communitarian. But there's been a shift towards egalitarianism. But unfortunately, there's also been a shift towards individualism. So Yes. It doesn't matter if you're becoming more egalitarian if you're losing the communitarianism. If you lose the community. Yeah. And yeah, that that's that resonates with me. And boy, how how much. Uh, because I think we also lose that in the analysis of scale. Hmm. Um, you it, it scale and individualizing go hand in hand. I, you know, I think of that uh, French author Welbeck. Uh, mm -hmm. writing about atomization and, and mm -hmm. how the people just become completely alienated when when there is no uh, community to be felt. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's a real problem of the age. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, fascinating. Um, I, I, it just struck me um, <clears throat> as, from talking now from an epistemological uh, perspective, uh, I'm, I'm very enamored of the Popperian uh, mm -hmm. uh, approach to, to science and that, that emphasizes evolution. Um, and it, it sort of makes one mindful all the time of the complexity of systems that you're dealing with and the difficulty in wholesale redesign or uh, causal structuring of, of a complex system. It makes one sort of humble about the approach to which you will go tinkering with something, whether it's a, a climate or a human body or a, an economy. Um, this would be my kind of starting point is to, is to say, well, let's see if you can make a change on the margin and try and detect whether it's good or bad and then keep going. And, and in a way that, that is kind of an, an epistemological uh, defense of uh, conservatism. And I don't mean it political conservatism only, I'm talking about general conservatism with response to pandemics or mm. to a patient presenting with an illness, you know, mm. uh, the first do no harm kind of principle. Yeah, exactly. But also embedded within that is this sort of idea of, uh, you know, to what extent does one rely on consensus? And that's become a big problem, I think, because somehow consensus... It's a strange concept in science, isn't it? It is a very strange concept, and yet it's being trotted out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, alongside the term authority. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I, I, I was, so I might regard you as being, um, having something to say that I would uh, uh, listen to much more carefully than, than uh, perhaps uh, uh, the opinion of a businessman with respect to the virus. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that's not the same as me regarding everything that comes out of your mouth as the gospel truth, because I know that a good scientist has 10 wrong ideas by breakfast and will change her mind several times in the next few years, you know? If they're a good scientist. <laughs> if you're a good scientist, yeah. right, right. Yeah, some very false binaries have been set up. Yeah. Yeah, I think. With horrible consequences. Mm -hmm. With very, very 
Great. When did you first uh, feel that something was going badly wrong with respect to coronavirus? Um, when the prospect, the specter of, of lockdown yeah. started to, to loom because you could see that this was going to be cause such extreme harm yeah. um, almost immediately. Yeah. And one could sense the sort of, um, you know, faults, the myths that were going, starting to yeah. buttress the concept. Gaining an almost religious uh, yeah. fervor mm -hmm. very quickly. Yes, and through, and got... through rituals such as clapping for the NHS. I mean, I found yes. you know, the NHS that's been, you know, systematically defunded over the last 30 years. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways you could say in this country, what we've seen is the crisis that we've experienced it has been a crisis of the national health system not functioning, which has then right. been transferred uh, to the young and the poor, the costs of which. Um, so, but then you, you know, you clap for them every Thursday. It, there was a ritual here of clapping mm. for them every Thursday. Uh, we have the same thing, eight o'clock bugles. Right. Um, and the hospitals are empty of coronavirus patients. They're the two biggest hospitals in the Cape don't have any. Um, Crazy. Well, we're actually, yeah, my, for a friend, well, my partner's sister who lives in Cape Town was saying that the, some of her friends are seeing malnutrition. Oh, yes. No, I've got a, yeah. I've got yeah, a side bed. Actually observing, you know, treating kids with malnutrition. So. I've got a side bed going as to how long it will take before Kwashiorkor was seen in South yeah. Africa after a 30 year absence. Mm -hmm. Because that's the that's the one that always gets me traveling in Africa. As you see the the kids, and you know that this is causing mental stunting and lifelong uh, yes. de de debilitation. And but for a few grams of protein a day, that you know, so easily fixed. So easily yeah. fixed. You know, I, I used to be on the board of a company that uh, produced a hundred million servings of protein a day in mm -hmm. in um, just for South African market. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the most horrifying statistics there was the, the, the intra-month behavior of sales. Around payday, people could afford um, protein. Mm. Two weeks into the month, and our sales would, would have dropped off. Uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but substantially dropped off. Uh, just simply so many households uh, experiencing just the economic accidents, you know, somebody mm -hmm. needing a doctor's appointment or losing mm -hmm. a school book or needing a school book or something like that would mm -hmm. remove protein from the okay. table. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's basically a middle income country. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, people live, people have very small margins, mostly, mm -hmm. they live, mm -hmm. even those who live, you know, yeah. semi-decently. No, I mean, and that's when I mean, you shock the economic system. Be, what, yeah. what has been shocking to me is how, uh, you know, educated people, people who are involved in this conversation or the discussions around coronavirus, have very little idea about what's going on in the rest of the world. Mm, mm, mm. When you yes. remind them, they say, oh, my goodness, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I, I refer to it as insouciance, the, 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 mm. the sort of ubiquitous insouciance of people, even, and you don't have to go outside of a country to, to find somebody who doesn't know what's going on in South Africa, but the way in which these um, academics and politicians and businessmen sit behind their Zoom screens uh, uh, prescribing, you know, quite devastating deprivation left, right and center for millions of people at a time. Um, and, and imagining that some kind of machine printing money would actually paper over those problems is just yes. staggering. It's been staggering. It's, it's actually yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And, and that the left has gotten behind this is particularly irking to me. Um, you know, the, the left wing papers are the biggest drum beaters here and they should all be on the other side of this. I mean, it, this is. I know. I mean, I, I've been facing enormous problems with The Guardian. They keep yes. publishing really quite defamatory articles. Yeah, um, we've had it with the Daily uh, Maverick in South Africa um, as well. Um, should be, and um, you know, even today we asked them, would they entertain an op-ed from us? Because they've not published a single <laughs> op-ed or, or an interview with anyone from the other side. It's all invective and a lot of it of a very low grade. You know, very low grade. Yeah, Post stuff posted on Twitter and uh, whatnot. I had, I had one. You know, I don't like to engage with Twitter. 
<laughs> I, I, I had one uh, prepared question, which I thought I would leave to the end in the okay. spirit of uh, right. yes, the sparkle actually. of creativity. Uh -huh. um, and that is, I would like you to tell me, do you have a mystery um, about coronavirus that, you know, if you if you had the fairy godmother come down and, and uh, answer one question for you or, or, or solve one problem for you about coronavirus, what would it be? What would I like to know about the virus most? <laughs> I mean, there's so many different things I'm trying to think of. Yes. What Let me give you some thing. categories. Transmission? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not. I, I think the transmission is pretty um, straightforward. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I mean, the obviously, I, I am interested very much in the immune response. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, if, if someone could tell me exactly, mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, what we're trying to do is infer what the immune response is and mm. how it develops and what part of it is directed specifically to this virus. And mm. I guess, yeah, I mean, if the, I think there's a big gaping hole in our knowledge of how the immune response mm. to the virus works um, and to what extent it protects you from mm. infection, disease and death. Mm. Mm. And the, the role of uh, this, this newer understanding in the field of mucosal immunology, do you think that's important here? I think mucosal immunity is yet another component of the immune response that yeah. we, um, you know, don't, it's, it's not studied very well. So essentially, because I've mainly worked on flu in the last few years, um, with flu, the sort of traditional antibody response in, in the blood, the humoral response is really mainly where it's at. I mean, there are T cell responses as well. I'm sure there are IgA responses, but in the coronaviruses, clearly it's, it's much more of a coalition of these other responses. Mm -hmm. And um, at the moment, that's what we're drilling down into. But yes, so if I had, if, if I had someone who knew the answer, I'd just say, can you just give me a little, um, you know, a little bit of insight into how these different arms of the immune response actually come into tackling um, a primary infection and or indeed a secondary infection. Now you forced me to up, ask a follow up uh, question, which is going to be slightly long. Um, I, uh, I'm used to thinking about the economy from a perspective of energetic analysis mm -hmm. um, and money. In, in, from that kind of perspective. And it struck me the other day that it might be useful to think of immunity in that way. I mean, the human body's in, bomb, uh, the way I sort of conceive of it, maybe I'm wrong, is that we're bombarded by potential pathogens and have been for billions of years, you know, b before even the invention of the mammal. Um, and uh, we, in, in that context, the way in which the, the immune system would have evolved would have been with one eye on the energetic consequences of the response. Um, yes, and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of struck me that the, the, the bee response, because of the, the temperature that you get and the fever and all of that looks like this uh, energetically consequential uh, response, whereas these other responses are lighter on the system, uh, less taxing on the system. And I wondered whether it isn't the case that in most diseases there's, there's, there's a uh, the whole system has been engineered to try and solve as many problems with the less energetic systems first. Um, so the less energetic, well, so, so the primary, I mean, we have so many layers of defense. So mm. indeed, you know, the, the, but, but a lot, there is a lot of investment mm. to prevent the, what you're describing as the high energy response, which is the inflammatory response, which will give you because not only does it have energetic costs, it has a direct damage. So a lot of deaths are actually indeed in, with coronavirus as well. It's the inflammatory response mm. that is actually causing the deaths, which is why a steroid, which will dampen that down, has mm. helps. So, so there are um, a lot of, there is a lot of investment within the immune system to mm. try and contain the response so that it doesn't, um, have a high cost, the response itself. But mm. then also the whole system is, has evolved to be as efficient as possible. And this is why 
the antibodies disappear from the blood because mm. you don't want to maintain a whole battalion when you can just have a sort of central memory of what to do when challenged. Next. Right, you, you'd, if you'd, you, you'd, you'd die if you had an antibody response to everything and that, that infected you and, that you and you maintained it for the whole life. It would, uh, would seem to me to be metabolically impossible. Exactly, it would be metabolically impossible. But that there have been studies about um, the trade-off between immunity and reproduction in other organisms where it becomes relevant. In our case, I think we, we have enough energy to, to deal, to do both so that they're not, one doesn't affect the other wow. in, in very obvious ways. But, you know, in a little bird, when they get malaria parasites, mm -hmm. that does actually affect their egg laying. So mm -hmm. in terms of the ener energetics, it has been um, that the sort of trade-offs between reproduction and defense, uh, there has been a lot of work done on that, but mm -hmm. I don't think it applies really at that level um, to humans, but it's certainly a, a running theme. <laughs> I'm very pleased that you brought the birds back into it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've got my favorite question, which I just wanted to see if you had any theories on, but the, the staggering thing for me from the start has been the, the, um, the, the geographic variance in disease burden that mm -hmm. we could not explain with average age, comorbidity prevalence and obesity prevalence, which are the only three really relevant uh, mm -hmm. factors, a small effect for prior season uh, influenza severity um, mm -hmm. or respiratory disease severity. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think is going on with um, that, the Asian uh, light epidemic relative to the Americas, for example? Um, okay, well, I mean, there are of course, fundamental ways of delivering health care. Mm -hmm. So in Japan, for example, I think that, um, you know, there's just better, and many other countries, that better infection control, uh, I think has played an important role. But, so that's at a practical level, but I think on a more speculative front, I think um, exposure to other coronaviruses could play a significant role. And this, there's an interesting paper that's come out, I think in Scotland, where they've looked at healthcare workers and shown that healthcare workers who have children in their household are much less likely to be hospitalized for coronavirus. Wow. And this goes up with the number of children in the household. It scales, I think almost linearly with the number of children. So I wonder if some of the vulnerable population uh, sectors of um, the populations in some of these countries where we have low death rates have benefited actually from child exposure yeah so that's kind of turning the whole multi-generational the risk of multi-generational families on its head mm. wow <laughs> so I wonder I mean no, this is you know I, I hesitate to say this as a kind of well, it's, whatever it's, the answer. These are things we need to, I think we need to investigate that because then mm. I think we can make some policy recommendations mm. for the future mm. for countries like the UK where you seal off the elderly, which A, creates this epidemic of loneliness mm. and then also keeps them, oh. you know, their, their immune systems are not challenged regularly that enough. to... to we and the other thing, I mean, just automatically, one, one thing we should be learning is not to go with one size fits all policy responses because you don't get enough variation to test with. You know? Exactly. Well, there's um, that. Well, thank God I, almost, for I almost celebrated when they failed to produce a federal response in America because you immediately knew you were going to get 50 different experiments run. Exactly. You know? Um, and and uh, th that couldn't be a bad thing. Um, we no. were going to learn something in the process. Absolutely. And we yeah. did, I think. Well, <laughs> our, our, our half hour has turned into an hour, which is going to leave my editors furious with me. I've done a terrible no, I job. Think that's great. I love it. I love it when they take all the rubbish that you've said and then 
collapse it into something really coherent and articulate. Well, I haven't heard too much day. rubbish coming out of your mouth. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a real it's pleasure. A pleasure. And wonderful. I wanted to thank you for serving on Panda's Scientific Advisory Board. It's wonderful to have you with us for that journey. And um, I hope indeed to correct the absence of a true face-to-face -face meeting at some stage. Absolutely. But let's be in touch meanwhile. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>